Okay, I'm going to be honest. I started reading this book two months ago. I got a few pages into the first chapter, and then I procrastinated reading it for like a month. I, I was like, ugh, not another craft book that's just going to go on and on about what not to do and why everyone doesn't write the way they write sucks and blah, 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 blah. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to write it. I don't care that my subscribers voted for me to read it. I am procrastinating. But then this weekend, I decided I was going to buckle down and I was going to read the book. I got to part two, and then I was hooked. This book is freaking good. As I read the book, I did a chunk of the suggested exercises, and doing that process led to a massive epiphany in my current project that I'm so excited about and that I desperately needed, and such good things. <laughs> so I'm going to start by talking about the, about the main content of Story Genius, then I'm going to give my pros and cons, why it may be for you or may not be for you. And then I'm going to give kind of an overview of where this fits in other craft books that I've read because I've read a lot of craft books. So let's get started. All right, let's start out. What What is Story Genius? Like, what is this book I'm talking about? The premise of it is to use brain science to go beyond outlining and write a riveting novel. So let's start out by just clearing this up. There's not really any brain science in here. Like, it's, it's not a lie, I guess. Like, if you think of brain science being, like, emotions, then sure. Um, like, she references a few studies, but it's, it's, not, it's not a science book. It's a, it's a writing book. What this really means, and beyond kind of the misleading subtitle, is she's not talking about story structure, pantsing, acts, writing techniques, writing good prose, anything like that. This book is zeroed in, laser focused on the why of your story, the emotion, the through line, making the story feel meaningful and connected rather than random things that happen. We start with part one, which is where I was very patient. It's only 30 pages. We can get through it. We can, we can muscle through it. But introductions to craft books are always awful in my mind. They're always like, a pitch saying why you should use this method and why everything else you've heard is wrong and it's it's just annoying but basically her point here is that popular craft books tend to focus on the external what rather than the internal why she talks about the hero's journey crossing the threshold facing the gauntlet blah 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 and how those are all external things that hint at the character's internal journey but don't really address it right and she said that this leads to a problem where writers are saying yep my character crossed the threshold okay but they don't think about you know why or they say oh yep yeah, i have to have a flaw my character has a flaw great but they don't get into like where that flaw came from and why it's important for the story another major premise or controlling idea or big idea i guess of the book introduced in part one is that context is key she has a whole section and i'm gonna be honest with you i got i was getting super annoyed about this um, about it was like endless for a while of telling us what not to do. Um, so in my Kindle, I highlighted the passage and I put a lot of swear words in the notes being like, ah, will you stop? Um, but she does have this whole section where she narrows in on why we focus so much on external stuff. And she talks about kind of why it's natural for us to do so and why that's ingrained in us from the time we were little. She basically says that story prompts often start with what if, like what if one day you came home and your parents had moved without you and they were gone. What she says is that, yeah, that's great. Like the surprise does catch our attention, but to write a story, what really matters is the fact that this event, for example, going home and seeing your parents are gone would mean very different things to different people. It would mean something different to a young kid. Um, it would mean different to someone who's like in a crime family. She's basically saying, and through this part, she's saying context is key. Why is key? Getting beneath external is key and context is key. Part two is the next part. And this is my absolute favorite bit. Part two is called creating the inside story. And it's all about creating the context in which the story will live. This part gets at so many issues, honestly, that myself and other new writers deal with. Uh, number one, we're told to write backstory. So we fill in the details. We're like, yeah, yeah, backstory. Blah, blah, blah. But it ends up not being super relevant or like it's really, really long and you're like, oh, okay, this backstory, great, let's move on. Um, another issue that we're, that we deal with sometimes is, you know, we're told, we hear all the time, give your character flaws, make them flawed. You hear that in Save the Cat, make them flawed, make their life suck. They are a 
throw the flaws at them, throw the flaws at them. A lot of time that stuff ends up never actually mattering to the story and just kind of random. <laughs> and so this part digs in at those two problems. It digs down and its aim is to help you organically create a point, which I would also call a controlling idea or theme for your story. And it demonstrates how to use that point as kind of like the through line or the third rail. And thank goodness I just read Casey McQuiston's One Last Stop because I had no idea what a third line or a third rail or whatever the heck was. Um, but thanks to that book, I do. So look it up. <laughs> it's something to do with the subway. Anyways, uh, she basically, she walks you through how to use that point to create meaningful backstory, to create this context around the protagonist, and to build the protagonist's misbelief. Because the protagonist's misbelief very much shapes the point, the controlling idea, the theme of your story. It is excellent, excellent, excellent stuff. Her method for a misbelief defining theme and then three other backstory scenes that like nail this into place, her emphasis on being specific and asking why. I love it. Part two was amazing. Like I seriously get this book for part two. I highly recommend part two. This is when I had my epiphany. I was weirdly, I was reading this at the furniture store. It's a very long story. Absolutely 10 out of 10. Great. Part three is called creating an external gauntlet to spur your protag's, protagonist's internal struggle. So here it gets a little less concrete. She basically gives us her scene card template and explains her story blueprinting method and then kind of walks through an example of building a story using that method. In that section, she talks about building in subplots, layering the aha moment, and doing the actual writing and story construction. So part two and three are the meat of the book that I think is the best. So pros and cons are favorite things. Hello, hello, hello. Before we get into the pros and cons, I just want to say, if you like this video, please think about giving it a big thumbs up. It really helps me. I really appreciate it. And if you aren't subscribed and you like hearing about writing and writing books and that kind of thing, you can press the button and hang around and it'll be fun. <laughs> Let's get into the pros and cons right now. Pro number one, it feels super fresh. I think this book hits on things that I knew I needed to improve on, but I wasn't seeing anywhere else. And it was the craft book that I needed because it hit on things and emphasized the things that honestly I tend to rush through. Things that are so, so important. And it kind of tells you how to do these things, how to reduce that randomness, how to create that through line, that meaning. I think you've seen it a lot. You see a lot of writing advice that's like, you need a through line, you need a point, your character needs a misbelief, a lie they believe but they never get into like how to construct a good one, how to make it feel organic, how to make it feel right, how to make it feel connected. And that's what this book did. There is a process. As another example, she advocates making scene cards, so outlining, and also writing, so like kind of pantsing, but you have a scene card for it, um, simultaneously. So she says that plotting and pantsing are bad. Um, I don't know if I agree with the are bad part, but I love the approach of doing both things kind of simultaneously and building the story that way. I love this approach. It makes sense. It's fresh. It's new. It's different. I haven't heard people suggest that before. A lot of things she said also, like creativity needs context or creativity needs constraints. Um, always asking why. They're actually very general innovation concepts that I learned or that were drilled into me during my master's. And I've never explicitly applied them to a story before. And I'm so excited to do it. Our con number one here is that the writing tone is sometimes a little off. There are some weird examples. Like in the beginning of the book, she talks about how Fifty Shades of Grey had terrible writing, but it was a great story. And she's trying to make the distinction between like writing technique and a story. And I agree with that sentiment, but like seriously, <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey? She's like, the reason everyone at Random House got a $5,000 bonus was because what a great story Fifty Shades of Grey was and how much people cared about the characters. And I'm like, did you read that book? I don't think a single person who read it gave a damn about those characters. But yeah, and that's like, it's a very small thing. But it's indicative of a few like really shallow, obvious, not quite accurate examples. They're, they're few and far between. Um, and it's mostly in part one and... You already know my feelings on part one. Just don't even read part one. Just skip to the good, skip to the good part. What's that song? So can we skip to the good part? Yeah, just skip to part two. <laughs> That's the good part. 
Uh, there's also a reference to like Louis C.K. and he talks about downloading a book on iTunes. I think those are just outdated references. So like they're not her fault, but some things felt a little weird. And honestly, like if I had an ebook, I might have like updated the ebook to not include those examples. I don't know. I would maybe try to make that edit. Also, as I touched on before, this book is not sciencey. Like it references some psychology studies in the first chapter and a book about like how the mind interprets language. Like it's not brain science. I'm an engineer. This is not a science book. Brain science in my mind is like neurons, firing, electricity, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I'm not saying it's false advertising. It's a book about writing. It shouldn't be about science. We should not be seeing mathematical equations about neurons firing. But like it's just a pet peeve of mine that people throw the word science around like crazy. Use this science here. Engineer your story. It's science. Because of science, science says, and that is not what happens. Science is not Simon. Science does not say that is not how science works. That is like literally the antithesis of science, being like science says this, because it almost never says that. It's I'm much more nuanced than that. And anyways, I'm not going on a tangent. Not going on a tangent is not important. But just know that. Just know going in. It, it's a book about writing. And she tried to differentiate herself by being like science. But it's not really. Pro number two. This is concrete methodology with, a, with an asterisk. You looking for something step by step? A checklist to follow? This book is for you. There is a very concrete process laid out here. Everything from starting with an idea and creating the book's third rail to organizing your computer folders. It's concrete, it's actionable. There are exercises you can do as you read, and that I did, and they rock. It's great. Con number two is it, it does feel a bit incomplete. Uh, this is the first time in my life I've ever said this about a craft book, but I think it could have been longer. In part three, she goes on an example and basically crafts the first five scenes of a novel using her blueprint, and I get that part three is basically explaining the blueprint method. So then you use that method to go and construct the rest of your story. But I feel like we talked a lot about the beginning and we talked a lot about the end, but we never talked about the middle. And I think it would be very fair for someone to finish reading this book and being like, okay, but like, what about, what about the other like 40 scenes <laughs> in the novel? Like, what do I do? What do I do about the middle? What do I do about the rest of it? You know, like, great, I got the beginning. I know there's an aha scene at the end, but like, what about everything else? That'd be a very fair reaction. That's why I'm going to suggest you pair this book with another story structure craft book if this is your first time reading a craft book. Um, I would have loved to see the suggested method for blueprinting summed up as well, like at the end with a little cheat sheet, like these are the things you do just to kind of bring it all together and make it easier to find things. Pro number three. This book has a really cool take on examples. If you know me at all, I'm really big on examples in craft books. I write books based on their examples. It's very important to me. I think the quality of the examples is huge. I learn by example. I don't like when people just talk to me. Most craft books use examples from published works. Think Save the Cat or Story Engineering. Story Engineering goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on about the Da Vinci Code. Save the Cat writes a novel, use a, a whole variety of really cool books and movies. In this book, though, the example is the author's friend who is writing a story using Lisa's method. So throughout, she gives us the writer's exact thought process of like, it could be this. I could do this. I know I have to do X. Maybe I could do Y or Z. And how she ends up crafting her book using this method. And then Lisa will pop in after, you know, a character sketch or something to say why this was good or how it could be improved. There's even legitimate scenes from her book that are included here, as well as scene cards. And honestly, I think this is a really, really cool way to do this. With published book examples, you only see what's polished on the page, right? So when Save the Cat says, oh, the break into two for Harry Potter, blah, 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 you don't know what it took the writer to kind of get there and to figure that out. And so with this way of doing it, you're like hearing the writer's thought process. And she's kind of in your shoes. And I haven't seen it done before. It's an applied example rather than an aspirational example. I believe it demonstrates Lisa's method extremely well. And I was just, I was on the edge of my seat to hear about this writer creating her story. Honestly, I love diving, diving deep under the scenes and like seeing and the process of how a story is created. That's why I loved StoryGrid when I first found it after all. And so it gave me the same feeling as Anatomy of Story, honestly, and that it is plain old fun to read, 
It's incredibly interesting just on its own before you even apply it. And I think the way she did examples was creative and effective. The third con, I am going to refer you to my author tube friend Charlie's um, channel below, Reader Turned Writer. She did a review of this where she pointed out that the author herself hasn't published any fiction books and she had some cons with it too. I don't think she loved it as much as I did. And so I'm just going to say, go read that, look at our two reviews, make a decision for yourself. So where does this book fall? I would recommend this book over story engineering. Absolutely. 10 out of 10. Oh my goodness. Story engineering is like useful in understanding the parts of a story. But that book to me was just like all fluff and definitions. It wasn't concrete. It wasn't telling you how to do stuff. It was kind of just telling you what a good thing would look like. I didn't find much there. I didn't love it. I liked this one. Like I really liked this one. It's practical. It's character driven and it's emotion driven, much more so character driven than the story grid. But I think um, the point or the third wire or the theme jives very well with the story grid concept of a controlling idea. And so I think if you paired this with something like the story grid, which has more concrete structure, you could kind of fuse them together. Um, and they would both kind of have the same theme, controlling idea being very important to it and then really get a story that both works structurally and is very deep emotionally answering those whys. Um, so I think this would complement the story grid really well. It would complement the anatomy of story really well because I think this is like anatomy of story, but zeroed down on maybe the first few chapters of an anatomy of story that are really focusing on need, weakness, desire, etc. This is also very much focused on those things. I think I even like this better than Save the Cat. This, this, this might be my new favorite craft book. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so glad that I found a craft book that I loved. So I really suggest this. If you have an idea of story structure already, I would still read something more basic first. I would read something like Save the Cat. Yeah, I would read Save the Cat writes a novel maybe first or something that's more basic around story structure, just so you have that in your head. And then I would read this and I would think of them both as equal things that complement each other. I love the advice in this. I love the methodology in this. I love the epiphanies I've got about my story from this. I love how much fun it was to read, how much fun it was to do the exercises. Altogether, I had an absolutely amazing experience with Story Genius. I think it is a great collect, great addition to any writer's craft book resources. It's awesome. Seriously. I highly recommend. Let me know what you think. Have you read this book? Do you like it? Did you find it helpful? I'm really curious to hear what you thought. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.